Good evening and welcome to Ministry Academy. Uh, my name is Mike Marr. I'm not Scott Bryan and the Five Solas. I didn't change that on my screen. Sorry about that, Scott. Uh, so anyway, my name is Mike Marr. This is uh, or this is Church History. Um, and up on the screen, we're going to get started in this, this outline. Uh, I'm teaching Church History, um, and I always start out the class by saying this, because one way to find out where you're going is to see where you've been. And, and one way to see where the church is going is to see where it has been. So I think there's value in looking at church history. And what we've talked about up to this point is all the way from Genesis up until Jesus. And we talked about a little bit about the apostolic period. Um, and the apostolic period is defined by that time from when Jesus ascended into heaven until uh, the end of the last time that the, the apostles were still walking the earth. So that goes from about 33 AD uh, to about uh, maybe 60 or so AD. So there's no mention in the Bible about uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, which was around 60 AD. So uh, we put our timeline right about there. That was about the span of time that the apostles were ministering. So that the big names in the apostles, of course, there was Peter, uh, who wrote some of the books in, in, in there. There was, uh, Paul was the big hitter. Uh, he's the guy who did a lot of the missionary trips all throughout the Middle, the Middle East, the Mediterranean, going around to, to Rome and on back down uh, through Jerusalem. Uh, and he's the one who carried the, uh, the message more than any other single apostle. He's the one who carried the message to the Gentiles. He's also the one that kind of challenged some of the tradition that you have, the, the old Jewish tradition, the rabbinic tradition of what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. So Jesus in his teaching really got down to the nitty gritty of the law about the, what the law was really like. And he pretty much brushed aside a lot of the rabbinical tradition that had become really important. And I tell people there is nothing wrong with the rabbinical tradition that's that's in in, in Judaism. If you're a uh, Messianic believer and you want to satisfy and, and, and live by all the, the all the rabbinical laws, I see no problems with that. So long as you don't look at your ability to satisfy the law as a thing that gains you righteousness to Christ. Uh, we talked about that in the class I was teaching last night. Uh, don't practice your righteousness in front of others. Uh, if you do, you get your reward in full. Don't look at the law as the thing that you satisfied and earned God's uh, favor. If you do, basically what you're doing is putting your, yourself in the place of God uh, because he is the one who makes you righteous. It's not you. Now, when God makes you righteous, you act a different way as well. So there's that going on as well. But all that was going on leading up until uh, the apostles. And that was some of the big messages that Paul had uh, for the churches in Galatia and Corinthians or Corinth. In Ephesus, uh, those churches around in, in Greece and going up into Turkey was saying, listen, it's not your ability to satisfy the law. It's not what you have done which brings you into relationship to Christ. It's what Christ has done that brings you into relationship. And now based on that, you have a different set of affections. You have a different set of desires. You have different actions that you're going to have because you've been changed on the inside with a new relationship with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus and the Father. So that brings us up. Uh, to the point we're, getting, we're talking about here. After uh, the apostles were done doing a, a lot of their missionary trips and they were starting to die out, uh, Christianity really kind of solidified in four main cities. Uh, Jerusalem in, in Israel and Antioch in Greece. Uh, those two were like sister cities. They had a lot of common ideas. A lot of their traditions were the same. Uh, and to this day, if, if you were to look at what uh, Eastern Orthodoxy has the people that were in Jerusalem would be much happier with Eastern Orthodoxy than they would with uh, Roman Catholicism or Protestantism. So Jerusalem and Antioch, Greece and, and Israel were aligned. The other one was Carthage or Hippo. That's that's in Northern Africa. A guy named St. Augustine, we'll talk about him later tonight, was big in that. And the other one was Rome. And Alexandria was tied in there as well. So it was like Rome and Egypt and, and Jerusalem uh, Israel and, and Greece, those were the, 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 the kind of separations between the church that had already started to begin. They're not denominations, but they definitely had their own sense of flavors. Uh, then talking further on about, um, you know, we talked about the age of the, the apostles. We're talking about those two centers. I want to talk a little bit about the age of the martyrs. Uh, martyr simply means uh, witness. So these are the people that witness to people or they're, you, can, you can witness what they're doing. But they're the people that are the examples of what it's like to follow Christ. The first one up there is Polycarp, who was the son of John. He was martyred in Smyrna for refusing to worship Caesar 
and he was, um, and, and he refused to deny Jesus. He wasn't denying Jesus the way I have it written. He refused to worship Caesar, and he refused to deny Jesus. Well, that was important because a lot of what was going on in that era area of the, of the world at that point was the Roman Empire was exerting control over, over everyone that they had conquered. And one of the ways they did that was they installed Caesar as a god king that you would worship. So he would take the place of the resident religion that was in that area. Now, Judea had a little bit of a buy on that. The Roman Empire allowed the Jews to keep their religion so long as they didn't rebel against Caesar. All the other places around the Persian Crescent, the Persian Crescent around the Mediterranean, uh, you, they went in there and they said, no, 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 you're not going to have your religion anymore. You've got to give worship to Caesar. If you want to go ahead and worship someone else as well, that's fine, but you've got to worship Caesar. And the reason why at first was just simply to have the, the country knit together with a common morale, a common idea, a common tradition. So the, the Romans tried to keep everyone together with this worship of Caesar. Polycarp refused to do it. And on top of that, he refused to deny that Jesus was uh, the son of God. He refused, to, he refused to deny that he was God himself. He refused to deny that he was a man. Basically, he upheld what we see Jesus as today. And that caused a lot of problems. Uh, he was a friend of Ignatius. Now, the way uh, that Polycarp was, was, was killed, um, I, I can't remember. If you, if you ever want to look up and see how the, the martyrs, how the, uh, the, the, the foundations, the, the fathers of the faith, how they lived their lives and how they died, there's a book. It's called Fox's Book of Martyrs, F-O-X-E-S, F-O-X-E-S, Books of Martyrs. And they talk, or he wrote a lot about how the different disciples had died, and how the apostles had died, and how the early church fathers had died. And I believe Polycarp was, was put at the burn. And he actually goaded on the people that were trying to burn him, saying, it's going to take more wood than that, what you're bringing. Uh, the attitude of the martyrs as they were going to be killed uh, really was, was pretty amazing. If there was a greatest generation in America, uh, it, it, that's, that title is given to the men and the women that served during World War II. Uh, but if there was ever a greatest generation of the, of the Christian church, that was a generation from the time of the apostles up until the time of Constantine. And that's where Polycarp stands he was one of those guys that wasn't afraid to die and actually did die for the faith uh, and, and gave a lot of uh, backbone and structure for what the church is today. Uh, the next guy, Justin Martyr, uh, he's really considered to be one of the first apologists. Uh, an apologist is a person uh, who gives an answer for the reason that you, for the hope that you have within you. Uh, now, we've redefined that in a sense to say it's someone who can argue with people well. And that's not really what the original meaning of the, the section in in uh, third or uh, uh, first Peter chapter three, uh, chapter eight or verse 18, it was saying we we're gonna give a reason for the hope that we have within you. Now, when, when the church began to become established and it had to defend itself in the market square, uh, we needed to develop arguments to be able to talk to people and not sound like we were uneducated and to be able to have good answers for people. So uh, guys like Justin Martyr came up and he started writing things that allowed us to help us reason through, through our faith and how to present the faith in a reasonable, logical, and intelligent way. Uh, the next guy is Arrhenius. He was a disciple of, of Polycarp, and he really dealt with the Gnostic heresies, heresy. And the Gnostic heresy was simply this. It said, I can learn more and more stuff, and I can become higher and higher in my spirituality based on what I know. And as a matter of fact, it even got to the point where, where it began to say, that the flesh is evil and the spirit is good. And through our, our knowledge of secret knowledge, our, our, our amassing secret knowledge of things that we know that other people don't know, we reach higher and higher levels of, of enlightenment and we get to the point where we can subdue the flesh and bring up the spirit. And in a lot of ways, you would say, well, that doesn't exist now. But in a lot of ways, it truly does. Uh, if you're ever in a situation in a church, uh, in, in, a, in a discussion with people, and people start belittling you based on what you know, you're entering into the, in the zone where someone may be under this false impression that they're some sort of a, a, an expert and you're less of a person because of them. Uh, the, the field is level at the foot of the cross. Uh, there is nobody who is better at being a Christian as far as, as being in front of Christ uh, the day they were born or the day they were reborn to the 40 years later on. You are just as qualified to be in front of Christ. Your knowledge and your maturity doesn't make you a better person. It helps you grow more and more in likeness to Christ. 
and there are benefits to you for that, and benefits for the people around you, but nowhere ever can you say that I'm better than the other person based on what I know. Uh, what we should do if we know things is teach people as best as we can, but we always should stay accountable to the scripture, realizing that that's the sole source of authority. We have to bring ourselves in alignment with that. Um, so Irenaeus was, was one who was really dealing with that. And, and a lot of the writings you'll find from him, he's a very intelligent person. Uh, he wrote very, very well, and he was a deep thinker. Uh, however, at the same time, he recognized his standing in front of Christ. And I think one of the quotes he had was out of Romans chapter uh, 12, verses 1 and 2. It says that you can actually be conformed to Christ instead of the world. And you can know the good, pleasing, and perfect will of Christ. And then the next verse right after that says, but don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. It's almost like he's saying, you can know God's mind, but don't get caught. Uh, and that was Arrhenius. Uh, the next guy um, was Tertullian. Uh, Tertullian was a guy who lived in northern Italy or northern uh, Africa. And uh, he was the first one to really formalize the teaching on the Trinity, the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, it was always being taught kind of in the background. Everyone talked about Jesus, and they knew he was God. They all knew about Abba, the Father. They knew he was the Father. But they knew the Holy Spirit had descended. So they all had this sense of it, but no one ever sat down and actually came out and said, listen, there are three parts to the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Uh, and they're all one, same essence, same nature, um, different persons inside that one, that one Godhead. Tertullian was the first guy who had that. He also had another little thing. Um, at the time that he was living, the, the church was starting to circulate letters to all different churches. And those letters were becoming the, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, uh, First and Second Corinthians, uh, First and Second Chronicles, Timothy. All those books were letters that were being circulated all throughout the Mediterranean. And they were starting to begin to be brought together and put into one book. And people were making a big push to have the, the book of approved letters and a book of And we're back. Um, so people were really pushing to have one book put together where they said, this is the list of, of books in the Bible that are approved. Tertullian didn't like the idea. Tertullian said, don't put together a canon of scripture. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that. I mean, he's an incredibly gifted and talented uh, church father. And I just want to let you know that there were people that said there's a danger in this. And here's what he said. He said, we have chased the Holy Spirit into a book. Um, I think there's a real danger sometimes in Sola Scriptura. I, I hold to Sola Scriptura. I say the Bible as written is the sole source of authority. However, there are revelations that come to us from the Holy Spirit that we need to compare against the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit will never con contradict the Scriptures. But there are some things that we need to know about the culture we're in now. There's things we need to know about the people we're dealing with that the Holy Spirit can enlighten us about. And Tertullian was really afraid that what would happen is that all knowledge and all revelation from God would be over uh, in our minds because we've gone ahead and put the book of the Bible down in print. Uh, in, in some denominations, this has happened. Uh, there are people out there that would say, God will never reveal anything to you uh, because he's already done it in the scripture. It's just redundant. Uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't talk to you at all. The only way the Holy Spirit talks to you is if you open the Bible and you read it. And I do agree that if you open the Bible and read it, the Holy Spirit talks to you. But I also believe that the Holy Spirit enlightens you when you're reading the Bible. And he also tells you things that you need to know about the people that you're serving around. He'll tell you things about the culture that you're living in. And he'll tell you things about yourself. Things, quite honestly, aren't going to say, Mike, you're doing the wrong thing. Um, it will, though, if he, if he convicts me of things, I'll go to the Bible and say yes. That has the character of the Holy Spirit. That has the character of the Scriptures. And that's God talking to you. So Tertullian said, be careful. Don't limit what you get from God to just being in the Bible. Uh, Origen, he was one of the greatest thinkers of the time. He was really uh, big on, on battling uh, different heresies that were coming up. So he was an important figure. And I'm not going into great detail on each of these guys. I just think you need to know some of the names of the giants whose shoulders that were standing there. Um, Cyprian, he wrote the Unity of the Church, which was a book that really helped us understand how we're brought together as a church body. 
and what it is that really brings us together, which is effectively our identity in Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, St. Anthony, he was the first of the, the monastics. Uh, he was one of the first guys that said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to form a, a band of brothers. We're going to be off on our own. We're going to be sequestered from the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're going to be off on our own, and we're going to devote ourselves to study and to worship in the regimen of the, of the, of the Word. So St. Anthony, and the last one I have up there is St. Augustine. Uh, St. Augustine lived in, in Hippo. He was the Bishop of Hippo in North Africa. And there was something really important about uh, St. Augustine. A lot of what the Catholic Church gets as far as the structure of its, of its church, how the, the bishops and the cardinals and the pope and all that is put together, how they did their, um, how they did their sacraments came from St. Augustine. Uh, he was pivotal in all, all that. But at the same time, if, you, if you're talking about Reformed theology, and Reformed theology came out of that time, we, we look at it as that time around 1500 or so, when Martin Luther posted the 95 Theses and said, the church is corrupt, we need to fix it. We need to reform the church because it's gotten away from the scripture. It's gotten a whole bunch of extra stuff added that's no longer really following uh, the model of Christ. Um, now, you may say that it's also Calvinistic. I don't think that's true. I don't think you have to Calvinistic to be reformed. I think what you have to say is we accept the, the idea that the scripture is the sole source of authority, that we're saved by grace, through faith, that we're saved by Christ, and that it's to God's glory alone. Those five things, in my opinion, uh, qualify you as a reformed theologian. And Augustine was probably the beginner of a lot of that theology that we get under the reformed doctrine, even though he was Catholic. The other important thing about St. Augustine is he wrote two really important books. Uh, the first book that he wrote that was really important is called The City of God. The reason why the City of God is important is Augustine worshipped Rome. Augustine thought Rome was God's city on earth. And, and he really adored the city. And everyone wanted to go to Rome. Rome was the place to go. And uh, sometime around 300 or so, uh, the Vandals invaded uh, Italy, ran down through Italy, and got to Rome and sacked Rome. They burned Rome. They, they, they destroyed it. And um, that really shook a lot of the people in the church to the core because they were looking at Rome like it was heaven. And all of a sudden, these, these heathens, these pagans come down from, from the central part of Europe, make their way all the way down through the Roman Empire, and they sack Rome and they go back. And they're like, how is it possible that heaven can be sacked? And it really challenged uh, uh, Augustine. And he realized something that was really important, that the city on earth is not the city of God. That the city in heaven is the city of God. And we have gone ahead and we've allowed ourselves to become enamored with what's on earth and we've forgotten about what really is going on in heaven. And the city of God, the whole book is really about that. It's about understanding that our hope and our future is not in where we are here today on the earth, but it's in heaven. The second big book that he wrote was called The Confessions. The Confessions were important because every other time a book was written, they always had a fictional character that would be talking about their life. Uh, I don't know if you've read Plato's Republic. Plato's Republic was written by Plato. The major character in Plato's Republic was Socrates. Now, there's, there's not 100% agreement on this, uh, but a lot of people, myself included, feel as though that Plato invented the character of Socrates so that Socrates was like an avatar for, for Plato, and he could go ahead and say the things that he needed to say, but he did it through Socrates. St. Augustine was the first person ever to write a book that says, here's what I did. Here's my failings. Here's my sin. Here's what I learned. Here's how God convicted me. And here's how God changed me. So St. Augustine's Confessions was really, when it comes down to a person just being real and saying, I was a sinner. And I was a sinner up until this moment that God changed me. And I regret all those years that I wasted as being a sinner I wish I had been made a saint. I wish I wish I had been saved by Christ much earlier than I was. So the 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 city of God said, "Don't put your hope in the world here." And confessions basically would give us a model to be honest and true with people and say, "Listen, Christians are not perfect. Uh, we have come from terrible backgrounds, and we still have terrible scars that we carry with us. Uh, but we're being changed day by day by Christ. It's not us. It's Christ." Um, that brings us to a guy named Constantine. Um, and, and it won't be this week, uh, but maybe next week, maybe the week after, 
I'm, I'm going to basically give you just the facts of Constantine, uh, what we know about. And then uh, we're going to basically have maybe between Scott and I a little bit of a panel discussion about the pros and cons of St. Augustine, or I'm sorry, uh, Constantine. Constantine was also known as Constantine the Great. And here's some facts about him. Number one, his mom was Hellenistic. That means that she was Greek uh, from the more modern, or that era of Greek. Uh, and she also, from all accounts, was a Christian woman. Uh, his father was a Caesar, so his, his dad was one of the emperors. Uh, Constantine uh, rose up through the ranks. So he started out as a commissioned officer in the Roman army. He worked his way up until he eventually was a general in the Roman army. Um, he fought with Maximus for the rule of Rome. Now, what happened? There wasn't a succession of, of leadership in Rome. Uh, it was only after Constantine that he established a line where the son of the emperor would become the emperor. Um, so under before Constantine, basically, you fought for your position as emperor of Rome. That's the way it worked. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the son has died. Constantine is a general. And he's making his way to Rome to fight to see if he could be the emperor. Uh, so he had a dream. He was on his way to Rome. He was fighting his way there, and he had this dream. And in the dream, he saw this sign in the sky, and, it's, and he heard a voice that said, in this sign, conquer. The, uh, the, the Latin on that is hic signa vincens. Um, but um, well, I, I lost my train. Sorry. Right. Oh, so he, he saw this vision, he heard this voice, he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. He's at the bridge of Milan, and, and he said, what we're going to do, we're going to take that sign, that symbol, and we'll put that on all the shields of the, the soldiers going into battle. And we're going to see if this, um, if this vision that I had is real or not. We're going to see if this voice had anything to say to me. So he puts the signs on the, the shields, they go, they have this big battle around the bridge of Milan, and uh, at the bridge of Milan, he had a stunning victory. And from there, Constantine marched into Rome. It was installed as the new emperor, the new Caesar. Um, and that was a big deal because what, what Constantine really said at that point was, this voice that talked to me is the God in heaven. And the God in heaven told me to conquer in this sign. So I have a debt to this, this God in heaven. He has some power. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recognize him. The very first thing he did was uh, pass the law of tolerance for Christians. Um, and what, what that was, it was kind of a broad sweeping thing. First of all, they wanted to stop persecuting Christians. Up until this time, Diocletian, I think his name was, and Nero, and all the other, all the other um, Caesars were really persecuting the Christians. I mean, they were putting them in the, the Colosseum. They were putting them in other types of arenas. They were feeding the animals. They were drawing them. They were quartering them. They were impaling them on spears. They were crucifying them. The Christians were being persecuted all the time. That's why the Christians were meeting in places like the catacombs, which were the, the tombs and the, and the sewers that were underneath Rome, because they couldn't be out in public. If they went in public and they were worshiping, they would be arrested and they would be killed. Uh, the people were killing them because they were still pagans, and they thought that if the Christians were worshiping that God, they would bring the wrath of their gods down on them, and, and bad things would happen. So the Christians were hiding because both the the law all officials were persecuting them, and the, the run of the mill, the, the citizenry were as well, because they were afraid they were going to incur the wrath of the gods. So what, what Constantine did, he said, you're not allowed to persecute Christians anymore. It still happened a little bit, here and there. But for the most part, it was effective. And some of the reasons for that is, at the time that Constantine came to power, uh, in some of the urban centers, the Christians were as much as 30 or 40 percent of the population. In some of the rural areas, there were maybe 10 or 15% of the population. So from the period of around 30 AD up until 300 AD, right in that range right there, the Christians went from a position of being very, very, very rare to having a sizable uh, majority or a sizable population inside the Roman Empire. Now, that caused a lot of problems. That caused problems because there was still the, the superstition of the pagan religions. And also the fabric of society was starting to change. Whenever the fabric of society starts to change, bad things start to happen. It's really hard to get people to be able to accept change. Um, sorry, I'm back. It's really hard to get people to accept change. It scares us. We want things to always remain the same. So he passed this, this law of tolerance for the Christians. And as a result of that, we're going to talk about that a little bit later as well overall persecutions and punishments in the nation of, of Rome 
became much more humane as time went by. I mean, there were still um, executions, there were beatings and arrestings, but it wasn't nearly as violent as it used to be. Um, the last thing he made, Christianity the official Roman religion. He said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make the, the, the Christian religion the religion of the state. We're going to sanctify it. We're going to say, this is what you need to do. Um, the next thing you want to look, look at is uh, the Edict of Milan. Here's, here's what the Edict of Milan was. It was a letter that Constantine wrote. He was the emperor. He said, here's what we're going to do. Number one, he made Christianity legal. In other words, you can't persecute it anymore. Uh, you can't um, you can't punish them anymore. Uh, it's allowed. The second thing it did is it protected Christians. It said, if you do harm a Christian and they didn't do something wrong, you're going to be accountable under the law. And the third thing it did is it returned property to the Christians because what was happening similar to Nazi Germany. Um, there was religious persecution in the form of people being killed and just their property being seized. Once it came out that you were a Christian, they could just come in and take all of your stuff. So he issued the Edict of Milan. The next thing, point five, he saw the church as a force to reunify Rome. See, he recognized that Rome was changing. He knew that it wasn't going to be the way it always was, that there were forces at play that can't, couldn't be put back together. And he looked at the numbers. Uh, I don't think they had George Barna or anything like that where they could look at statistics. But he knew how many people out in the countryside were Christians, generally. He knew how many people in Rome were Christians. There were a whole bunch of them. And he realized that, that the Christians were on the rise and the pagans were on the decline. And he knew that if he put himself in with the pagans, he would be losing control of the country. So he looked at the rising power of Christianity and he said, that's where I'm going to put my finger. That's where I'm going to put my trust. And I'm going to start working with the Christians, because they're the ones who are going to be able to give a common tradition to hold our country together. A nation has to have a thread to hold together. If you don't have a tradition in a country, it's going to fall apart and probably do so violently. And Constantine recognized the fact that Rome had to be held together, and Christianity was one way to do it. Um, the, the sixth point, Constantine was identified with the church, but, uh, so Constantine liked the church, he liked the Christians, he said, we're going to put our weight behind them, but point number one, he was not baptized until he was about to die. When he was on his deathbed, that's when he had his baptism. Second point, he believed God gave him the right to rule the nation and the church. Um, we'll probably talk about this on another day, but there was a there was a council that was, was taken called the Council of Nicaea. And the way that the Council of Nicaea was done, uh, there were a lot of there were a lot of debates in the church. So people are arguing about all sorts of things. It's kind of like today. People arguing about should you have hymns, should you have uh, choruses, how you decorate the church. It's crazy what Christians argue about. And Constantine was really, really worried because he said, you know what? I need to hold Rome together. And these Christians are bickering about all their different points of doctrine. So what we're going to do is we're going to call all of them together and we're going to settle this once and for all. So he paid for the transportation for all the bishops to come to Nicaea for a council. And all the bishops are gathered there, and the, the, the thing's about to start, and no one really knows who's in charge of the Council of Nicaea, because there isn't a pope, there isn't a hierarchy in the church yet. This is being established in Nicaea, and then later under Constantine. So no one knows who's in charge, and right when they're all starting to wonder, should we even be here, these trumpets sound, and a band starts up, and Constantine comes marching into the chambers, and he's wearing a, a garment with gold thread and blue and purple. And he walks in, and there's this, this dais in the middle of the area where all these bishops are. And on top of this dais is this enormous throne. And Constantine, to the fanfare, stomps up, and he walks up, and he sits down to the throne. The music stops, and then he says, all right, now we start. Now we do what we're supposed to do. Um, and and I, I see in Constantine, there's, there's a little window in to his, um, his showmanship, I guess, but also the idea that he is the one in charge of the church. Uh, Constantine did not view the bishops as the one ultimately in charge of the church. They were ruling in his favor. Uh, he, he got them there to Nicaea. He organized them. He told them to get started. They did all their stuff. When they got all done, he ratified it, wrapped the whole thing up, and they were out the door. Now, that didn't take just one day. It was, it was a long council that they had. But they came up with a thing that we call the Nicene, the Cre the Nicene Creed. And if you ever look it up, look up the Council or the Creed of Nicaea, the Nicene Creed. 
Um, so he believed the church gave him the right to rule the nation and the church. Third, he believed the future of Rome rested in the church. And we talked about that. Uh, if Rome was going to succeed, Rome was going to have to succeed unified. And the only way for Rome to succeed unified is if the church was unified. And he put those two things together. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the crisis due to Constantine. This gets a little bit into the, the critique of him, uh, but we're going to go a little deeper and, and talk more about it uh, next week. Uh, so the crisis due to Constantine, number one, Christianity became a lot easier. Like I said, if there was a greatest generation in the church, it was probably in that period from the, uh, the, the death of Christ until the beginning of Constantine when there was a lot of persecution going. Um, I really think if you if you look in in, uh, in China right now, you see a church that is really really strong because it doesn't have any of the support of the government and has a lot of persecution coming from the government. Um, I think if you're really a Christian in China, you are sure enough a Christian in China. Um, if you're a Christian in the United States, especially here in the Bible Belt of the South, you know sometimes it's just what your mom and dad did. You go to church because they went to church. I asked someone one time, when did you accept Christ? And they told me when when they joined the church. And I'm like, well, it's nice that you've been in the church that long. But my question is, is when did you surrender yourself to Christ? And they really didn't know the answer to the question. I think there's a lot of people in the United States that don't know the answer to that question. But I think in China they do. And the reason, the difference is, is we have complete freedom to do whatever we want. And we have our traditions built in where that's just what we do. We go to church. Mom and dad went to this church. I go to this church. Now, some of that is passing away here in the United States because whereas in Rome, Christianity was ascending, here in the United States, Christianity is actually descending, uh, at least as far as the numbers go for the people that profess and actually go to church. Um, I don't think there's a, there's a real problem with the real big C church. I think there's a lot of problems with the little C church. I think there have been a lot of people in the church that never were Christians. And maybe the fact that our numbers are decreasing is really getting rid of the fluff out of the church, not necessarily the fact that the numbers of real Christians are decreasing but the point is once the church once the religion became legal and became protected it was a lot easier to become a christian it was a lot easier to become a social christian the next one is conversions gave some standing so in other words once you converted when you converted to christianity before constantine you were living in the sewers when you got converted uh after constantine you you basically were socially accepted you could be in all the right places that's where the Who's who hang out now is in the churches. Um, the third thing is the state could, took control of the church. Um, I think that's a big problem. I think state involvement in churches is a really bad idea. Um, I, I got to meet Jimmy Carter one time, and uh, I actually enjoyed the meeting that I had with him. I didn't really like him much as a president, but um, after getting to meet him and talk to him, I was impressed by his character. But then he came out, and he really disappointed me one time. When he was talking about the faith-based initiatives that were coming up, and he said, I think it's a bad idea because I think it will corrupt the government. And I agreed with him. I think that the faith-based initiatives through the government were a bad idea, but not because it would corrupt the government, but because it would corrupt the church. I really feel as though uh, the Christian church doesn't need the government's help, and I think the strings that come with government involvement are dangerous. Um, now, that may be a little bit of a political view on things, but if we're looking at church government and we're looking at church history, What's happened around Constantine is we moved from the church being independent from the government and actually being persecuted by the government to being part of the government. Uh, so that's a problem. The, uh, the fourth thing, pagan customs were adopted by the church. Now, I don't have any problems with celebrating Christmas. I think Christmas is a great holiday. I don't have any problems with celebrating Easter. And we come here at this, this church or other churches, and we celebrate um, we celebrate the the, the Day of the Lord for our worship service. We don't do it Friday evening sundown to Saturday evening sundown. Uh, and I don't think we have to do it on Saturday. I believe that, that God opened it up and said, you have to have a Sabbath. I don't care what day you have it, but you have to have a Sabbath. Now, that said, what 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 all these things, Christmas, Easter, and, and Sunday worship do is they follow an already existing pagan tradition that was in place. So Christmas uh, was actually celebrated as the winter solstice. It's a time when we pass that, that point at which now we're starting to come back towards summer in the rejuvenation of nature. Uh, Easter was a celebration of a fertility rite. It was the, the beginning of spring. Um, 
I really think that that you can celebrate Easter and Christmas and it's fine, but I, what I'm pointing out is this. We got away from uh, the Passover, which is what the early church would have celebrated, would have been a, a Messianic Passover. And we got away from uh, celebrating maybe when Christ was actually born sometime in, in uh, mid-summer or late summer. Uh, and we basically said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to allow uh, the state to go ahead and fit us into their already established niche. Uh, the already established niche was the celebration of Christmas on, on winter solstice, the celebration of Easter or Passover as a replacement for the fertility. And you can see that today, by the way. Uh, the fact that we use a, a rabbit as one of our things for Easter, uh, for the secular side of it, that's a fertility symbol. The fact that we use eggs, that's a fertility symbol. Now, what I really believe uh, Easter is about for people in the United States, they don't know it's a fertility tradition. What they know is that kids love candy, chocolate is good stuff, and we could drop eggs out of helicopters if we want to. We have a lot of fun, and we remember the birth of Christ. Uh, so I don't have a problem with it, just making that distinction. But what it does point to is the fact that something changed in the church. Upon the, the, uh, the, the reign of Constantine, we became a little bit more Roman, uh, and we became a little bit more political. So what we're going to do is next week, I'll work it out with Scott. If he's going to be here to do that, we'll, we'll let you all know. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit more about Constantine and about what some of his influences were, uh, both pro and con, and see how that has effects in the culture we're in exactly right now today. Because the, the truth of it is, is history has an effect all throughout time. So from the beginning of Constantine until now, there's an effect that we're feeling due to his reign and his rule. So, uh, if you have any questions, the link is on the screen, info at thepioneernetwork.org. If you have any questions or comments, send them to that email. Uh, they'll be forwarded around to us, and we'll answer them the best we can. Uh, and we'll get back with you next week and talk some more about Constantine. So, good night, and see you next week.